Hi everyone, my name is Ray Hassan. I'm a Principal Product Manager for AWS Glue and AWS Lake Formation. Today I wanted to talk to you about data governance uh, in the cloud and how you can do more with your modern data uh, platform. So uh, data growth is increasing and we're finding new ways to use this data. The, the current platforms aren't really able to scale to deliver the features that customers need to keep pace with the demand of the, the business and, and, and our customers. Modernizing this data platform in the cloud gives us the freedom to um, almost infinite scale, speed, and choice. Google Trends also uh, shows us the, the increasing interest in data modernization over the last few years that is fueling the trend of moving data and analytics workloads to the cloud. To be successful at extracting insights and value, companies are uh, changing uh, to, the structure, to structure their organizations around their data specifically. Uh, we see patterns such as uh, centrally managed data platforms uh, where the single team is responsible for producing data and making it available for others to consume. There are also models like hub and spoke and data mesh that enable distributed management of data production and consumption. In all of these scenarios, uh, there's a need for data governance to ensure the data is always protected uh, and to drive adoption and usage within this organization or your organization. Uh, becoming a data-driven organization requires data, lots of it. Uh, to be successful at using data, you need to have a data governance program that defines and enforces rules, practices, and processes uh, to ensure all of the data is secure, accurate, and is not misused intentionally or unintentionally. Implementing a proper data governance program uh, at your company will increase adoption of your, uh, your data lake and also help accelerate the pace of innovation. Let's take a few minutes to talk about some of the core components of a data governance program uh, that you will need to accelerate adoption of your data platform in the cloud. First and foremost is security and privacy. Uh, most, if not all of our uh, valuable data includes sensitive information like customer names, phone numbers, credit card detail, etc. Uh, securing the data means protecting it against malicious use and exfiltration. All data should be encrypted at rest. Uh, I don't think there's, there's any question about it, right? We should just, just do it by default. Uh, many data storages like, uh, like Amazon S3, for example, makes it easy to enable this encryption automatically. So you don't really have to do a whole lot. Uh, setting um, access controls allows you to restrict access to the data based on roles and responsibilities. So the data is only uh, visible to those who are authorized to use it, not everybody. Uh, it also provides an audit trail that uh, can be viewed on, on a regular basis to ensure, to ensure compliance, right? Double checking that whoever has access to the data really needs access to it. Perimeter security using firewalls helps protect against external breaches and hacks uh, to be able to, to gain unlawful access to sensitive information. Data privacy uh, really ensures that customer sensitive information is always protected, even when the security is breached and data is stolen. So if everybody got, if somebody got through all those controls that we talked about before, being able to protect the data at rest. Uh, so if anything leaks is really important. So to protect that data, we, we really choose to kind of mask or maybe even obfuscate or tokenize some of these sensitive fields uh, when they're ingested directly into the data lake. So when they're stored, they're already obfuscated and masked and tokenized. Um, they may only be detokenized or de, you know, demasked if the user has the proper permission to see that information. And many times, Users don't need to see it. It's maybe an application that's processing a credit card request that needs to see that, that credit card detail, but a user should never see it. All right, so data, data is not really useful if the quality isn't good. I think everybody kind of knows this and, and have run into issues with data quality problems in the past, but this means that before users can do anything with this data, they need to clean it, right? They need Things like replacing missing values and fixing timestamps and things like that. 
um, they need to make it really fit for use. It's a process that takes time and effort and is repeated for almost uh, all of the data sets that user need, unless there's an automated process designed to clean the data, right? So data also needs to be accurate. Uh, I recently reviewed uh, usage metrics for, for tag-based access controls inside of Lake Formation. I wanted to understand you know, how well is the, the feature being adopted by our customers. So I spent, a, uh, spent hours, <laughs> I think it was, it was a long time, uh, trying to make sense of the data and couldn't really figure out why the data seemed off. It just didn't seem right to me when I looked at it. Uh, eventually, after talking with uh, a couple of the engineers, we identified a bug that caused certain metrics to be reported incorrectly. The bug was introduced in a recent release and we caught it actually pretty quickly, but the data I had was just simply not accurate. Um, processes and tools really help us reduce the possibility of inaccurate data making its way to users, dashboards, or even reports, right? Um, being current is also becoming a critical need for fast moving companies, right? It used to be okay for data to be 12 or 24 hours old because data processing just simply took time, right? We didn't have the technology to go faster. Uh, but we now need data to be as current as five minutes or even a few seconds. Uh, still data is the same as inaccurate data. We don't wanna make decisions based on it, right? So we need to be able to have all that set up and working. Access controls, so access uh, to data must be managed and enforced in a, in a really consistent way so that regardless of how users and applications want to access it, the, the same permissions are applied, right? You don't wanna have different permissions be applied based on different tools or having to make compromises and settle on a common denominator that works across all the tools. So if data is classified, is being sensitive, for example, a user who doesn't have permission to see sensitive information should, uh, you know, should have the columns removed or even the field masks directly from the results. But for a user with uh, proper permission to see the information, that data should be available. Uh, Fine-grained permissions and attribute-based access controls is how organizations can manage and control access to data at scale. So, Understanding the life cycle of data, how it was produced, transformed, and consumed is important for users to determine if the data is a good fit uh, for their use case uh, and if something that, that they want to, to take advantage of. Tracking the life cycle of, uh, of the code used to produce and transform the data improves the observability and helps to troubleshoot quality and accuracy issues. Uh, it also helps to audit uh, any changes that may have introduced anomalies into the data. Many customers create uh, these sophisticated data pipelines orchestrated with tools like Apache Airflow or AWS Step Functions. The lineage can actually capture many, uh, the, the, the many steps that, these, uh, that the data takes through these pipelines to get to its final destinations and the final form or, or state of that data. Uh, but it's not just that data, the data changes, uh, it's also the metadata such as you know, adding or removing columns, changing data types, and applying specific classifications to columns. Uh, lineage needs to track these changes as well. So business analysts, data scientists, and even auditors can understand, um, you know, how the data was created truly end to end. So that, that's an important aspect to, to be able to capture that all the lineage information. One of the common challenges uh, I hear from customers who build uh, data lakes but find it difficult to, uh, to get their users to use it um, is that no one wants to own the data set. Uh, data, engineering, uh, data engineering teams, you know, they kind of build the pipelines, they ingest the data, transform it, they maybe stage the data for analysis, but they're not really you know, they're not usually the owners of the data, right? They just move it along, but it's not really their data. Um, they don't truly understand the meaning of the data and how it should be used. So if a user has a question, um, it's very hard to track down somebody who understands the data and really can answer the question about the data itself. Um, not just the structure of it or what's in it, but what does it mean? Right, so to solve that problem, it's important to assign data owners to every business critical data set. 
um, someone that can validate the quality and accuracy of the data, um, someone who can answer questions on how the data should be used, and someone uh, who is authorized to give uh, users access to that data with the proper fine grained permissions. Um, data ownership is really key to improving data lake adoption by users. And I've seen this across many, many customers that I've worked with. And they kept saying, you know, we need to find owners. We need to be able to, for users to go ask questions and, and get access to this data from somebody who actually understands it. And that, you know, after defining that and after making that visible to users that there are owners and they can go find them, adoption of the data lake really became um much more, uh, much more uh, um, robust, I guess. So another thing is uh, when I meet with customers to talk about their data governance requirements, the conversations tend to start with data discovery. Uh, I think it's just the most visual thing. It's the, 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 the biggest ask that they get from their users is how do I find data? Right? So they're, they keep they're saying, right? The, the users struggle to, to find this data. Uh, and they need a single place, a central catalog to inventory all of this metadata about these data sets that are stored in a bunch of different places, right? Um, a single place to find everything. That's really what they're looking for. Uh, the metadata in this, uh, in this catalog really needs to also include context, such as business glossaries and taxonomies, uh, a way to describe the data in business terms so it's easier for users to figure out which data sets will work for their use case. So it's not just about knowing that a data set exists in this one place, but also knowing what it means and what does it mean from the, with the context of the business itself so they can make uh, better decisions whether they want to use that data or not. So, the core data governance components that we covered uh, up until now, security, privacy, quality, access controls, lineage, ownership, and discoverability uh, are all tied together through metadata. We always talk about the importance of data and data gravity, but we can't forget the importance of metadata that describes this information, this data itself, right? Uh, it helps us understand the structure of the data, like is it CSV, JSON, images, audio, uh, it helps us understand if the data contains sensitive customer information, like phone and credit card numbers. Uh, it helps us understand if the data is fit for use so that we can make business decisions based on accurate and current information. It also helps us control um, access and audit usage. It describes the end-to-end -end life cycle of data so we can understand how it was derived. Um, for example, uh, the, the data that goes into financial reports and to train machine learning models, right? We want to be able to go back and say, well, how, you know, how was the data derived that produced those results, right? It's really important to do that. Uh, it also tells us who is the owner of a data set, right? Who, uh, who is accountable for its quality and responsible to keep it current? Uh, all of this metadata really enables better discoverability, observability, and auditability so customers can use uh, more data quickly, but also responsibly. So every company needs to have a data governance program. I think that's, that's clear, or if it's not clear, it should be clear. Um, you know, uh, and, and, and it really, it takes time, right? It takes time to create one, uh, get everybody on board, uh, get the processes moving, uh, but you can start by making sure that the technical tools and platforms, right, the, the infrastructure you design include the required components and capabilities to generate the metadata needed to enable data governance, right? Making it easy for users to find data and access it in a secure way is the easiest way to kind of get started, right, with, with governance. Um, so I created this, this data governance flywheel to try to illustrate how the different metadata working together uh, can accelerate and improve a company's data governance program. Uh, it basically, in, 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 in effect, really help them become more data driven, right? So yes, it's not just about technology, but this data governance, uh, sorry, the, the, the metadata and the flywheel can really start kicking off that adoption and really moving things along. So as more information becomes available to the company, hey, now we can find more data sets. Oh, now we can secure them. Oh, we can also audit them, right? And that will drive the program, the, the data governance program and get more people onboarded quicker. 
So the next, uh, the next few slides will go into more technical detail on how to build a modern data platform that include data governance and the components we talked about. Um, but before we go there, I, I wanted to highlight a specific approach for building a data platform that we call in, in AWS, we call this the lake house approach. Um, it's not a specific architecture, but rather a design pattern uh, that suggests how to set up a central data lake on Amazon S3, which gives you scalability, security, and automatic data lifecycle management. Uh, it also makes uh, scaling your data lake super simple. Um, other services like AWS Glue, for example, can help you move uh, data around your data lake in and out of purpose-built data services uh, to really make it easy to combine data but also make it available in different tools that users want to use and, and know how to use. Um, and you know you can you can do all of this with uh, central governance and ensuring data is of good quality and accurate, lineage is tracked, uh, data is protected, and, and access is is controlled based on on the right permissions. So this this lakehouse approach really gives you a pattern to design your data platform in a way that is scalable, secure, and cost effective. Next, um, I wanted to introduce uh, AWS Lake Formation. Uh, some folks may already heard about it and, and know what it does, but for those who don't, uh, Lake Formation is a fully managed data governance service that first makes it easy to build uh, data lakes by automating how data is moved into S3, updating it, right? You got to update records, you got to delete records, really keeping that data updated. Um, optimizing it so you get the best uh, performance when querying the data and also cataloging it, right? Gotta, gotta find it somehow, right? So, so Lake Formation helps you do that. Second, uh, it makes it easy to grant or revoke fine-grained permissions to data in a single place that ensures consistent uh, enforcement when users try to access this data in a data lake from their choice of analytics or machine learning tools, right? So defining permissions once and regardless of what tool you bring to go analyze that data, you should have consistent uh, enforcement of permissions, right? So it's not that one tool gives you column and row level security, but another tool doesn't, right? So now we have this consistent enforcement across the board. Uh, and third, it makes discovering and sharing data sets between teams and uh, an organization really, really simple. So driving more, uh, more adoption and more collaboration. Cool. All right. So this, this is starting to get a little bit more technical. So hopefully um, I, I, can, I can keep everybody engaged. But uh, so the data governance platforms uh, really need to offer all of those capabilities we've been discussing up to this point, such as security controls and fine-grained entitlements, searching and auditing. Um, it should also be flexible enough to enable you to build your platform in the best way that suits your organization, right? whether it's a small scale data lake running in a single AWS account, uh, or maybe it's a hub and spoke design with a central data lake account feeding many uh, consumer accounts responsible for their own analytics. Um, or maybe you, uh, maybe you want to build a data mesh, right? I, mean, uh, I think folks have heard about this. It's popular these days. Everybody's talking about data meshes. Uh, maybe you want to build a data mesh, right? With an independent uh, data domains that act as producers and consumers of data. You may choose to deploy central governance on top of this data mesh or just let each, uh, each of these data domains be governed independently by themselves, but still have the same uh, processes, the same guidelines and rules for everybody, and maybe even the same technology so you're consistent across the board and you know the tools that you have for data governance are gonna offer the right feature functionality that you need to serve the business. Um, so AWS Lake Formation and also Zaloni's uh, Arena Data Governance Services uh, give you the flexibility to build your to build to your business needs without compromising on security and governance. Cool. So let's um, let's take a look at an example of how to build a hub and spoke data lake with lake formation for data governance. So I'll go through a, a few of these steps as kind of we build this out um, to kind of show you how you'd build this architecture uh, in, inside of AWS. So the first thing we start, as you can see, we have two, two accounts, right? There's a data lake account and there's a consumer account. 
The data lake account has a set of buckets, right? A set of S3 buckets. This is where we store our data. Um, there are multiple, there may be multiple buckets, some buckets for raw data, some for tr uh, um, transformed data or trusted data, and other for the refined data, right? So the trusted data may be something that we, uh, we've we cleaned up, we got ready, but it's not quite refined yet for some use cases, but it's 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 data that machine learning uh, data scientists can use for, for data processing. So we have we have these buckets, they're protected, they're encrypted. Um, so we have we have the, the, the security already in place. Um, the next thing we want to do is we want to be able to go and register those locations, those buckets with Lake Formation. And that basically tells it, hey, Lake Formation, you need to go manage these buckets. You need to be responsible for uh, securing those, those particular buckets. Once we do that, uh, we then are going to use something that we call the AWS Glue crawlers to automatically go and, and scan that data and extract the schema information, the technical metadata out of the, that, those data sets um, and put them into the catalog, right, into our data catalog. So now we have the schema information, we have column names, we have uh, data types, et cetera, et cetera. So now we've started to kind of build our data catalog so users can come and discover data sets. The next step is we, we want to transform, right? So as we move data from raw to trusted to refined, we're transforming, we're enriching that data, but we're also updating the metadata, right? We're capturing lineage. We're, we're letting the, the catalog know like, hey, we're making these changes. Uh, we're improving the data. We create a new data set, so let's catalog that. We've created, uh, we've made some changes, so let's capture that lineage. Um, so we can do that using AWS Glue, which is our, our serverless data transformation, data preparation service. Um, and then that catalog continuously kind of gets updated. The next thing we want to do is now we want to share that, that those metadata. We want to share those tables and those databases with our consumers so they can go and query the same data as well. So our data lake um, collected the data, transformed the data, updated the data, now we're going to be creating this, this resource link, right? From account data lake, we're going to create a, create a resource link using lake formation to the consumer account. And what that does is it basically creates a copy, not well, not copy, creates a creates a link, creates a reference from um, this, the data lake account to the consumer account. So the users in the consumer account can open up their catalog and go look and see the same data sets that exist in the data lake, or at least the ones that we shared with them. Um, so we have that we have that catalog. At this point, a data owner or a data steward comes in and actually grants access to the local users, right? So instead of the consumer account, we have a set of users. Not all of them have permission to all the data. So we have to go and intellect permission. We have to give them fine-grained controls uh, or permissions on top of the data sets so they can go and, and see what they want. Once we do that, then they can go and access the data and, and query it using Amazon Athena, Amazon Redshift, um, you know, any tool that they want, they can just run queries on top of the data based on what they were given permission to see. So that was a very simple way of, of creating a single uh, data lake account, uh, staging the data there, transforming it, building the catalog, and then sharing specific data sets with consumer accounts. Now I may have other accounts here and I may share different data sets with them. Right, and that gives me the flexibility to control the data lake in one place and only expose the data that I want to the specific consumers. Now, these consumers may be inside of my company, maybe they're partners, right? Maybe they're third parties that uh, also run on top of AWS and they have their own AWS account, and I want to share just a table with them, or I want to share a specific set of columns from within a table with them. I can do that through Lake Formation, right? So let's. Um, Let's kind of shift gears into a slightly more complex example. And this is a very popular example. We've, we've had, I've, I've did other webinars that kind of dive deeper into this as well. Uh, but this is really about building a data mesh architecture, but still enabling central governance. Um, so if you can see here, there's, there's three accounts. The first one is the data lake account. You can think of it as the producer. Um, there's a central governance account. Uh, think of it again as a federated um, governance. And then there's the, the third one, which is the consumer account. Now, in my case, the consumers and producers are independent. They're not both consumers producers in one account, uh, but you can do that just, just as simple. So on the data lake side, on the, on the producer, again, it starts very similar to what we've seen before. We have our, we have our buckets. 
The main difference here is that from the central governance account, we're going to actually register those buckets. So we're not going to register them in the local account. We're going to register them in the, in the central account. Um, we then take the same table that we registered, right? And we crawled it. We, we, we did what we did before by crawling and extracting the schema. And we built that table in the central governance account. Now we're going to share it with the data lake account, right? So the data lives in the data lake account, but the table is managed and controlled by the governance account. And then we share it back into the data lake account. So the data lake account can um, run their own transformations on top of that data, right? So now they're doing their enrichment, they're doing their ETLing, they're doing their quality checks, et cetera, et cetera. But they're updating a table that's actually managed by the central governance account. So they've done this, the central governance, the, the, sorry, the central catalog is updated, right? So now think about this. I may have multiple of these data lake accounts all updating tables managed by the central governance account. So I have a central catalog that shows me all the data sets across these different data domains. So now that I have that, I wanna then share those tables with my consumers. I have one consumer here, I may have more, many. Um, I can simply from the central account share these, these data sets, whether it's a database with full of tables or individual tables, or maybe even specific columns of a table um, I can share that with uh, my consumers. And then as we saw in a previous example, right, this particular user, uh, this particular account can now um, do their own analytics. So they create their own local table resource, they grant permissions on those tables, and they bring their engines and they run their analytics, their machine learning, whatever use cases they want on top of that data. So what this gave us is a, um, a model where we can have independent data domains that are producing and managing data so they can own their own data. We can have other data domains that are consumers of that data, but we can still have a central governance uh, place to be able to provide a central catalog. So anybody can see any data that belongs to any, uh, any of the data domains. We can define permissions in a single place, right? So we don't have to worry about many places. Um, and we have a way to audit access. So we know what's going on and we have a place that we can capture all the lineage information. Um, so we know how data is transformed and we can update this catalog so users can actually explore the lineage uh, of the data sets that they want to use. Now Zaloni Arena can fit very nicely inside of this, uh, this central governance and provide some additional functionality um, you know, with, with all of the, the governance workflows and, uh, uh, and approval processes and all the, the, the nice features that Arena provides on top of this environment, working tightly and very closely with Lake Formation through our integration uh, of the APIs to give our customers a better experience, a more rich experience with data governance that their, their companies need, right? Now, this is very simple, or not very simple, but this is, this is, this is a simple sort of example of, uh, of a data mesh design. And as I said, we can now just expand it, right? The same model works. The central governance account remains the same. We simply add more consumer uh, accounts or even more producer account, data lake accounts into our, uh, into our data mesh, expanding and growing as your organization scales and grows. So with that said, um, you know, I kind of want to summarize this. So I, I guess in, in summary, uh, the data volume and variety will continue to grow exponentially every year, right? I don't think we, 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 we can deny that. Um, and, and, you know, we talk to customers, but, and everybody's telling us like the competitive advantage really comes from understanding this data and taking educated actions based on it. Right. So we need we need to be able to enable companies uh, and our customers to, to, to define and uh, sorry, to define and build their data governance programs quickly and easily so they can start doing more with this data in a secure but also responsible way. Uh, so 
I'm here to show you cool technology as, as you saw with lake formation and, 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 and arena, but it's not just about the technology, right? You also need to define your governance processes and you gotta make sure that everybody in the company is on board, right? All the way from the CEO down to the, to the, to the business analysts, to the users, to the um, engineers and the ops folks, you really need to get everybody on board to be successful with the data governance program. Um, I also want you to remember that metadata is really, really important. Uh, it's as important as the actual data itself. Without proper collection and reporting of this metadata, we're really swimming in the middle of the ocean uh, without a life jacket. Uh, so AWS Lake Formation and Zaloni are your life jacket. With that, um, thank you very much for your time today. Again, my name is Roy Hassan, and now let's open it up for uh, some questions. Thank you.